Okay, it, um, Ellisberg is walking from the guest house and it's uh, probably not here yet. So I'm going to introduce myself and I'll start. So <laughs> in the interest of keeping with time. So, so my name is Senthil. I'm going to be giving three lectures on uh, novel phases of strongly interacting condensed matter systems. Um, so this is the first lecture. It's going to be on symmetry protected uh, topological phase of matter. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at the school. I'm looking forward to meeting and interacting with many of you. It's my uh, first trip to Jerusalem. Uh, so I'm looking forward to being in the city. So I thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. Obviously, it's not my first trip to Israel. I speak fluent Hebrew. In, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't speak fluent Hebrew. <laughs> and this is not really the, I'm told that this is a mistake. And that my name is not actually pronounced this way, but since I have no idea what this says. <laughs> uh, my hope, and as I started already, it's, I hope it's OK. <laughs> so my hope is that uh, my lecture is more comprehensible to you than this writing is comprehensible to me. OK. Uh, so. So I decided to start my lectures by talking about topological insulators because they're extremely simple states of matter. Uh, and they'll set the stage for some of the more complex states of matter that uh, I'll discuss as we go along. Uh, uh, so many of you, most of you probably have heard or have been exposed to some of the physics of topological insulators. Uh, so before I get started, uh, uh, um, I should confess that when I started preparing these lectures, I assumed that maybe 15, 20% of the audience will be experimentalists. How many of you do experiments? One. All right. Very good. Uh, uh, you know, so I tried to pitch it at a level where it would be interesting, though perhaps somewhat challenging, but at least interesting for a motivated experimentalist. Right? Uh, so let's see how it goes. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 I also gathered that some of you may have backgrounds in high energy theory rather than condensed matter theory. Uh, I guess I'd, there are a few people like that. All right. Uh, so let, let's see how it goes. You know, feel free to ask questions and so on. I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, so within free electron, so topological insert is the big. Uh, one of the big discoveries in condensed matter physics in the last decade or so, uh, we've learned that in free electron band theory, there is two distinct kinds of insulating phases in the presence of uh, symmetry, uh, uh, for instance, time reversal. There's the conventional band insulator, and there's the topological band insulator. And similar distinctions are known in the band structures of superconductors. Uh, so what does that mean, band structure of superconductors? Right? So in a superconductor, there are uh, Bogolyubo quasiparticles, which are fermions which are described in BCS theory by some free fermion model. And uh, the, the dispersion of those, the band structure of those Bogolyubo quasiparticles is what uh, one means by talking about a band structure with a superconductor. Uh, and again, there's a concept of a topological superconductor. And I believe Eres Berg's lectures already would have covered some of this. Uh, uh, that would have told you some things about topological superconductors. And there's tremendous. Uh, a theoretical progress in understanding the various possibilities for topological band structure. There's a, a complete classification of all gap phase of free fermions that uh, happened uh, sometime in the last few years. Uh, so, uh, so let me give you a very quick uh, lightning review of some of the properties of topological band insulators. Uh, so the usual characterization of a topological <coughs> insulator is that uh, though it's insulating in the bulk, there's an unusual conductor at the surface. So in two dimensions, uh, there's this phenomenon known as the quantum spin hall effect, where the 2D bulk is insulating, but at the edge, there are conducting edge modes. And uh, the, the, these conducting edge modes are such that the spin of the electron is tied to the direction of propagation of the edge mode. Okay? Uh, and in three dimensions, there's this, uh, the, the 3D topological insulator has a two-dimensional surface. Uh, and that surface uh, famously hosts this uh, 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 electrons, the Dirac dispersion. Uh, and the crucial thing 
is that there's an odd number of these Dirac points uh, below the Fermi level, uh, at or below the Fermi level in the system. Uh, so, so why is such a surface interesting? That after all, you know, insulators that have metallic surface states are quite well known in solid state physics for many decades. Uh, but the, the particular metallic surface state that exists in a topological insulator is very weird because unlike any other metal, uh, you know, usually if you take a metal and you make it dirty, you can make the system an insulator, right? Uh, the, you know, the impurities will scatter the electrons and eventually they'll be able to localize the electrons and the system stops being a metal. But here, you cannot make the surface insulating with any amount of impurities, at least in the free fermion approximation, so long as you preserve the symmetries, in particular, so long as you preserve time reversal symmetry. So this is a very weird property. It's a, metal, it's a very robust metallic surface, and, and the met metallicity of the surface is protected so long as uh, the impurities or whatever else you have in the system preserve time reversal invariance. Okay? Uh, so at the level of phenomenology, that's what's interesting. Uh, uh, more conceptually, if you have a d-dimensional solid in a topological insulating phase, the surface theory, uh, where the surface is a d, d minus one dimensional system, and the, and the theory of that surface is in a very precise sense impossible in a, in a, in a regular d minus one dimensional solid with the same symmetries. Okay? The, more, the, 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 the more technical way to say impossible is that it's anomalous uh, in a sense that, in a, in the, in a, in a sense, uh, in which that word is used commonly in the field theory literature. So, for instance, the single Dirac cone, single massless Dirac cone that exists at the surface of the 3D topological insulator is uh, not an allowed band structure of any 2D time reversal symmetric metal, but it's something that is, uh, then that's uh, uh, something that was known for many decades. Uh, uh, but it's something that is realized physically at the surface of the 3D topological insulator. So what kinds of materials are uh, one talk, talking about? Uh, so in 3D, the topological band insulator requires spin-orbit coupling, uh, uh, which, and spin-orbit coupling uh, couples the spin of the electron to the lattice, and the lattice uh, you know, breaks the rotational symmetry of space, and therefore, uh, in the presence of spin-orbit coupling, uh, there's no rotational invade, continuous rotational symmetry, and spin conservation is completely lost. But spin-orbit coupling has the interesting property that though it breaks spin conservation, it preserves time reversal symmetry. Uh, you know, it's L dot S, roughly speaking, and L and S are both odd in the time reversal. Uh, uh, so early materials in which this phenomenon uh, was uh, explored were things like these uh, uh, alloys made out of bismuth, bismuth selenide, bismuth antimony, bismuth tellurium, and so on. There's many, many materials by now. There's a huge explosion of uh, materials. Uh, uh, for the purpose of what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in these lectures, what's interesting are some current candidates that people are, have, are exploring. Uh, uh, a famous example is samarium hexaboride. Uh, so samarium is one of those rare earth elements that lives as an outcast in the periodic table. It's, uh, it has sub partially filled F orbitals, other rare earth alloys, there are oxides of iridium, and so on. Uh, so the thing that's interesting about this class of materials that people are exploring currently is that they involve electrons from atomic D or F orbitals, and typically, uh, when you have materials in which the important uh, electrons co come from D or F orbitals, you have to worry about the Coulomb interaction between the electrons very seriously. So these are strongly correlated materials. And you know, experimentally, what people would like to know uh, or suspect uh, is that perhaps they they also show topological phenomena. Okay. So so that then gives us a context to think about topological insulators beyond the framework of band theory. Uh, so they were originally discussed within the band theory framework. Uh, you know, uh, the band structure was some in some sense topologically non-trivial. But band theory is just an approximation to real life. So in real life, the electrons are strongly interacting. So what, uh, how should we really think about topological insulators without the crutch of band theory? And how does the physics change once electron-electron interactions are included? Right? So these are some of the questions that you know, the field has to confront 
as it matures, right? And it's matured enough by now that we should be confronting these. And uh, you know, the theoretical kind of span of the community has been confronting this issue in the last few years. Uh, and we now appreciate these topological insulators are a special case for more general class <coughs> of states of matter, uh, known as symmetry protected topological phases, SPT for short. Uh, which is going to be the subject of my talk today. And these may occur even with electron-electron interactions. And uh, uh, the essential idea is the following. Uh, uh, we want to imagine a phase of matter of, uh, say, interacting electrons uh, in some number of dimensions, which is separated from a totally trivial gap phase by a phase transition. So, and, uh, and it's necessarily separated from this totally trivial phase, a totally trivial insulator uh, by a phase transition, so long as uh, you know, some symmetry is preserved. For instance, uh, so long as, say, time reversal and charge conservation are preserved, uh, we, want to, we want to imagine a phase that is sharply distinct from a trivial insulator, but that nevertheless preserves those symmetries. Right? Uh, but we also want to imagine that if we break the symmetry by adding some perturbation, for instance, a magnetic field, that it's possible as a matter of principle to go smoothly from this phase to the trivial phase. Okay? Uh, so if such a phase exists, then that would be a phase that is distinct from the trivial phase only in the presence of a symmetry. And breaking the symmetry makes it smoothly connected to the trivial phase. Okay? So that's the general idea of a symmetry protected phase that is distinct from as being distinct from a trivial phase. Okay. Uh, okay. So as we go along, uh, we'll learn a lot more about exactly what an SPT phase is and why it's interesting, important, and so on and so forth. So, so some of the properties uh, of these SPT phases. Uh, but that first, we want to demand that they are gap phase of matter. Uh, so they are gapped, but slightly non-trivial. They are almost trivial, but slightly non-trivial. Uh, so the gap phase of matter that are nevertheless distinct from the most trivial gap phase, the most trivial insulator that you can imagine. Uh, and the distinction exists only because some symmetry is present. And if you remove that symmetry, uh, you can go smoothly around. So we want them to be gapped, but we're also going to demand that despite being gapped, uh, uh, there's nothing exotic about them in, the, in any standard sense. There's no exotic quasiparticles, no fractional statistics, no anions, no fractional charge. You know, oh, the kinds of things that you might have heard about, for instance, in Subi's talk, Subi's uh, very first talk, uh, gapped insulators with fractional charges and emergent gauge fields. We want to forbid all those things. So these are essentially trivial in the bulk, but they may still support non-trivial edge modes. Okay? So that's the kind of phase that we're going to think about. Uh, and of course, free fermion topological insulators definitely satisfy these properties. They are gapped. And because they are free fermion systems, they have no exotic excitation. All the excitations are electrons, and that's it, or composites made out of electrons. No fractional charge, nothing. You can't get that in a free fermion model. But of course, we know that they do support non-trivial edge modes. Okay. Um, so there's an old example outside of the realm of free fermions of this kind of phase, and that's uh, 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 a very famous example. Uh, part of this year's, uh, last year's Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> this year? Oh, last year. Last year. Last year. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, so Holdain, uh, in the 1980s, famously described this uh, spin-1 antiferromagnetic chain uh, and pointed out that uh, its spectrum, that it has, that there's a, there's a unique ground state with, with a gap to any excitation whatsoever if you put the system on a closed ring. Okay? So 1D chain on a closed ring, on a closed circle, has a gap to all excitations and a unique ground state. Uh, but this state of matter uh, that Holdain described, which is now known as the Holdain chain, uh, was recognized shortly thereafter uh, to support uh, exotic boundary excitations. Uh, so the edge, if you make an open chain, 
at the edge of this uh, uh, 1D holding chain, there are dangling spin half moments. Okay. Now, I, I presume all of you have heard about the holding chain, at least through the popular press, if not through years of study. Or you can always consult um, Asa's book, Asa sitting out there. Uh, um, but there's a remarkable phenomenon, right? You have a spin chain that's made out of spin one degrees of freedom, but somehow if you make it an open chain, then at the end, you get spin half degrees of freedom. How do you ever produce spin half out of spin one, right? Uh, so that's, at least for the high energy physicists in the room, you should ponder on that question. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing that it can happen at all. And it happens without there being any gauge fields, nothing, right? It's, uh, 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 in, in that, that kind of phenomenon you saw ha happened in the lecture that Subir gave, and it happened in the fractional quantum hall effect and so on. But here it's a lot simpler than any of that. There's nothing, there's nothing fancy that's supposed to be going on. But yet, the system does something weird, right? So this is an example of uh, an SPT phase. Uh, in this case, these edge states, the non-triviality of the edge state is protected by symmetry. For instance, if I apply a Zeeman field, a magnetic field to the Zeeman effect, it'll spin polarize the edge spins. And there's nothing interesting left at the edge anymore, OK? Uh, uh, so the non-triviality of the edge is, the edge is non-trivial only so long as some symmetry, uh, in this case, the time reversal, for instance, is preserved. Okay? Uh, so this uh, is perhaps the first example in, of uh, a symmetry-protected topological phase. And the topological insulators and topological superconductors are you know, later examples that came two decades after this one. Uh, so let me, for those of you who've seen it, it'll be a quick reminder of what, what the physical picture is for how the spin one chain accomplishes this feat. For the others, uh, it's a cartoon, right? Uh, the way to think about it is to think about each spin roughly as being made up of two spin halves. Uh, and each spin half then grabs a uh, spin half from a, neighboring, from a neighbor and forms a singlet bond. And you keep doing this. Uh, and that gives you a state of candidate wave function, which is uh, very close to the exact ground state, which is uh, 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 which has short range spin correlations, but it does have the feature that there's one spin half left over at, at the edge at, at an open boundary, and that's a dangling spin half moment. That's a non trivial edge state at the end of the 1D holding chain. So, the cartoon picture that is useful to get roughly the right idea is to think about this the line of uh, children, say, holding hands uh, and rigidly. They really like each other, so they ho hold each other's hands very tightly and don't let go. Now, if you're a nerdy physicist, you look at this picture and say, let's describe the state of the system. And you forget about the children. You only focus on the held hands. And you say the, the Hilbert space of these held hands right, is that anywhere, anytime you look in the interior, there's a pair of closed clasped hands. right, And it's rigid. But if you look at the end of this chain, then you see that that Hilbert space disrupted and you have a free hand that can move freely. Right? So that's the rough idea. And that's the physics. You know, the quantum mechanical version of that is the physics of the holding chain. And I believe this, uh, Ellis probably explained this kind of thing in talking about the Majorana modes in 1D uh, uh, superconductors. That touched upon it, yeah. That, that's why I'm also only touching upon it. All right. Uh, uh, so what we have, the landscape, uh, is that uh, there's the Holden spin chain, which is a certain kind of phase, which is trivial in the bulk, but has non-trivial boundary modes uh, that are protected by symmetry. Uh, that's one example. And the other example are these topological band insulators, which do <laughs> something similar. They're trivial in the bulk, but have non-trivial edge states protected by asymmetry. And the question is, uh, is, is that all? Or is this, is this just the tip of something much bigger? Right? Once you see one example, you want to ask, with, oh, a couple of examples, you want to ask how general this phenomenon is, how to think about it, and so on. But the importance of the holding chain uh, is that it tells you that this kind of phenomenon 
is not confined to free fermion systems, and it happens much more generally uh, in strongly interacting many body systems. Okay? So let's contrast this with uh, some of the interesting phenomena in modern quantum kinetics matter physics. Uh, you know, some of the most amazing things in kinetics matter physics are amazing. One of the most amazing phenomen phenom phenomenon is the fractional quorum hall effect and uh, uh, related things, where one ends up with uh, this exotic notion of fractional charge in an interacting electron system. And correspondingly, there are anions, there, which could be abelian or non-abelian. So those are all really, really cool things, right? Uh, so, now, another amazingly cool thing that uh, uh, focuses on much attention in modern kinetics matter physics so phases of matter or phase transitions in which this entire picture of quasi-particles completely breaks down. Okay? Uh, for instance, in non-fermi liquid metals, and it believes to be talked about uh, at least a model which has such a feature that, this, that you can't describe this, this concept of elementary excitation that we learn in many body physics when we first learn it. Uh, the, you know, there's, there's an implicit assumption there that the excitations of a complicated many body system can be described in terms of a set of elementary excitations. But that may not be true. And there are phases of matter where that is explicitly not true. And I think you heard an example in Subi's talk. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, another axis of interest in kinetics matter physics, trying to come to grips with uh, such phases and phase transitions. Now, in talking about SPT phases, we are explicitly going to forbid all these cool things, right? Every cool thing that one has heard of uh, in the last 25, 30 years, we want to say, let's force the system to not do it, right? It's sort of a very sadistic game. You take your face of matter and say, I'm not going to let you do anything interesting that I know of. Can you still wag your tail somehow? <laughs> so that, that's the game. Uh, is anything interesting left if you forbid all the really cool things that can happen? Okay. Uh, it's sort of a fun thing to do, you know. Uh, but we'll see that it's uh, more than just fun. It's actually a really useful and important exercise. So why should we do this? It's a, so why should we study SPT phases? Uh, so there's a practical answer to the question. I, I'm pitching this now to, the, to our experimentalist friend. Uh, was that you? <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, these phases may be there, right? Uh, if they are there, then we should study them. And they are there in the, uh, the whole chain exists in real life. So do free from your own, so do, or, you know, uh, bismuth and selenide exists in real life. It's a topological insulator. Uh, so that's your interest in studying SPT phases because they exist. Then one should focus on systems with realistic symmetries in two, three, in you know, in one, two, or three dimensions. And uh, you know, some of the literature in this field, there is a lot, huge literature. And if you open up some random paper, chances are you might find people talking about SPT phase in seven dimensions, right? Uh, clearly, they're not motivated by this question. <laughs> right? uh, so if this what motivates you, then you should focus on systems with realistic symmetries in uh, ordinary dimensions. Uh, um, so there's many ongoing experiments that are looking for topological phenomena in such interacting insulators. Uh, I mentioned some iridium hexaboride and the iridium oxides and so on. So what kinds of things might you expect, exper might they find? Can theory theorists sort of try to tell experimentalists these are the kinds of interesting things that you should be looking for? OK, so that's one motivation. Uh, now, the other motivation is uh, uh, more from theory, uh, more conceptual. Uh, so these are perhaps the, this, these phases are perhaps the simplest context to study the interplay of three different themes in modern kinetics matter physics, uh, the interplay of symmetry, topology, and strong interactions. So all these things have a role to play in describing the physics, in producing the physics of an SPT phase. But the SPT phases are so simple because we forbid all kinds of non-trivial things from happening that 
we can really hope to make enormous progress in understanding them. And indeed, enormous progress has been made. Now, the amazing thing is that uh, despite being the simplest context to study these uh, interplay of these phenomena, uh, what we've learned is that there are wonderful insights and very deep and wonderful insights into much more complex kind of matter systems that comes out of studying SPT phases. So uh, some of the highlights are that we now have a much deeper understanding of the entire notion of fractional charge and fractional statistics in, uh, when they emerge in a condensed matter system. Uh, we, we've obtained all kinds of constraints on what are acceptable theories of some highly non-trivial phase of matter. And I'll talk about quantum spin liquids later. Uh, I guess Subir already uh, gave you an introduction to quantum spin liquids. And both Subir and Sean Hartnold might have talked about non-fermi liquids. Uh, um, and there's many, many interesting connections to recent developments in the field theory and math literature. And Natty might talk about some of the connections to the field theory literature. I'm not sure exactly, but it, it, the word SPT might make an appearance in Natty's talk. Perhaps. M maybe I'm just forcing it. Like, maybe I should just tweet it. And <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. Uh, so rather than just an isolated curiosity, SPT faces, it turns out, are centrally connected to many other frontiers of modern condensed matter physics. So from a theoretical point of view, that is the main reason to invest time in learning about SPT physics. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, we, we say we, we declare that we want to study SPT insulators. But it turns out that in the process, one learns a tremendous amount about quantum spin liquids, which is partly why I chose to club these two things together uh, in these lectures. We also learn a great deal uh, um, about the uh, exotic quantum critical points in two dimensions, uh, which are beyond the Landau paradigm, something that I might mention in my lectures as we go along. Uh, and it turns out that all of this is also intimately connected with the physics of the 2D fractional quantum Hall effect and uh, the concept of composite fermions in the quantum Hall effect. Uh, so each one of these earlier was a separate topic of research, but now we learn that together with the SPT, they're all unified into the same topic of research. Right? And that's something that we only learned in the last couple of years. And it's really amazing that, uh, for instance, studying something about quantum spin liquids tells us something about uh, you know, uh, the Hoffel Landau level of a 2D electron gas. Right? In fact, it turns out that studying three-dimensional quantum spin liquids uh, will teach us profound things about uh, composite from liquids in uh, composite fermions in the 2D quantum Hall effect. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so my plan for these lectures is to describe some of these physical systems. Uh, the core will be on SPT phases. That's today's uh, this morning's talk, uh, and on quantum spin liquids. Uh, the original plan was to make that this afternoon's talk, uh, but I may go slowly, and you know, uh, uh, so I don't know. And if, depending on time, I'll also talk about uh, these land of forbidden quantum phase transitions and composite fermions in the quantum Hall effect and so on and so forth. Okay? So I should say that my emphasis will be completely on the physics rather than on the math. Uh, again, in studies of both SPT and in spin liquids, uh, there is room, uh, if you're so inclined, to use very fancy math concepts to, to say something interesting about uh, these systems. Uh, so if you, you know, have a certain level of comfort with uh, algebraic topology or you know, all kinds of other fancy things, there is a way in which you can use that knowledge and contribute to the field. But for most of the rest of us who don't know anything about any of this fancy math, it's possible to make enormous progress and understand a great deal of physics without knowing any of that stuff. So what I want to emphasize in these lectures is uh, the, the physics angle, the physics viewpoint on these interesting phases of matter. Okay? Uh, a lot of the recent literature you'll find 
if you try to read it, uh, does involve rather advanced math. But uh, the good news is that uh, depending on, you know, uh, as is always common in physics, depending on the physics questions that you ask, you don't actually need to know that advanced stuff to contribute to the field in a really important way. OK. So I should say that I'm do a little bit of this talk with slides, and then at some point I'll switch to the board and not go back to slides. So B tells me that going back and forth is a bit complicated. <laughs> OK. OK, so that was all for motivation. Now let's start with the actual scientific stuff. Um, so what are some of the questions that we might want to ask about SPT phases, right? So at some conceptual level. So one of the motivations uh, that I described was to say, look, uh, band theory is an approximation. It involves free fermions. How do we know that any of this stuff survives in real systems where the electrons interact strongly with each other? Right? So the first question is whether free fermion SPT phases are stable in the presence of interactions. Okay? Next, we might wonder whether there are new faces that have no known interacting counterpart. After all, the holding chain exists. Which uh, So the spin system, there's no notion of a non-interacting limit. Right? Spin systems are interesting only if they interact with each other. Right? So there's obviously no free fermion description of a spin system. Uh, so how general is that? Uh, if I have electro interacting electrons in three dimensions with uh, spin orbit coupling and this and that, uh, say in samarium hexaboride, are there new possibilities for topological insulating phases that cannot be described within the framework of band theory? And if so, what are the physical properties? What is the experimental realization? So on and so on. Okay? So let me start with the first question. Are free fermion SPT phases stable in the presence of interactions? Now, uh, it's known from work in the last few years that some of the free fermion SPTs, which, as I said, were classified in 2009 or so uh, exhaustively, but some of them are known to be unstable to interactions. There are examples in, in every dimension of this phenomenon where something that is a, uh, a distinct phase of matter within the free fermion approximation is no longer distinct once you include interactions. Okay? Uh, now, these are all in uh, fairly, you know, uh, these, these are uh, the examples that are known are all in topological superconductors and, think, and, and uh, other such systems. So if you're a practical man, like our experimentalist there, you might wonder whether you know, real topological insulators, say bismuth selenide or uh, bismuth tel telluride, is afflicted by the same disease. Is it really a novel new phase only within this approximation of free fermions, whether it's really stable as a distinct phase in the presence of interactions? Right? Uh, so a usual spin orbit couple topological insulator is stable to interactions. So that's, in some sense, a zeroth order question that we want to address. And the answer is yes. And I'll illustrate this in three dimensions uh, through a very simple argument in the next slides. It's a very simple but very, very powerful argument. And part of the reason to do this is that it will help me build up a way of thinking about topological insulators that's beyond the framework of band theory. Right? So the entire goal is to now stop doing band theory completely in talking about topological insulators and characterize them you know, as completely as possible without ever mentioning band theory. Right? Because if we had to mention band theory, then we're relying on an approximation. Right? And the physics of the phase, if it's robust, it has to be robust beyond band theory. OK. So let's start with some very trivial observations. So we're going to be talking about systems of electrons in three dimensions, right? But with some short range interactions uh, on some lattice, maybe, or in the presence of disorder. Uh, and we've already said that we're interested in insulators where there's no, no exotic excitation. There's no fractional charge, not, nothing. Right? So in, in such an insulator, all the excitations carry integer electrical charge, n times e. Because there's no fractional charge. Right? So the only excitation that exists carry integer charge. Uh, if n is odd, 
then this excitation must be a fermion. Because you put together an odd number of electrons, you get a fermion. Uh, if n is even, uh, this excitation is a boson, because an even number of fermions makes a boson. Right? So everyone agree with this? Good. <laughs> because this is uh, it's a trivial but very crucial observation. Uh, now we're going to probe this material by doing an experiment that uh, even our wonderful experimentalists will never be able to do. Uh, uh, because we're going to probe the system uh, by introducing uh, a magnetic monopole inside the material. Right? So obviously, he's not going to be able to do it because uh, you know, he doesn't have magnetic monopoles. But suppose he did. Right? Uh, so there's going to be a way of defining the properties of this phase of matter. Let's imagine that we grab hold of a monopole and stick it inside this material and ask what it does. It turns out that understanding what it does will give us a profoundly non-perturbative way to think about the properties of this material, as we'll see in, a, in the next slides. Okay? And to remind you, uh, an elementary magnetic monopole is a source of H C over E magnetic flux through Dirac's quantization condition. There's mag magnetic field lines coming out of this monopole. We want to see how, it how the material, how this medium responds to the insertion of such a monopole. Now, we all know that magnetic fields are odd under time reversal and electric fields are even under time reversal, right? So this means that magnetic charge is odd under time reversal, but electric charge is even, okay? Now, suppose that this medium responds to the insertion of a magnetic monopole by creating some electric charge around the monopole. Let's say the electric charge where was Q, okay? Now, the time reverse partner of this monopole, let me call that Tm. Uh, uh, because the magnetic charge is odd, the time reverse partner has opposite magnetic charge. Okay? But uh, because electric charge is even, it must have the same electric charge Q. Okay? The, material the material has time reversal. I'm talking about ordinary spin orbit coupled. I'm talking about bismuth selenide or, and, its, and its various cousins. Okay? Uh, yeah, so I'm also assuming that electric charge is a good quantum number, right? So the symmetries that I'm assuming are charge conservation and time reversal, okay? And that electric charge is even under time reversal and magnetic charge is odd under time reversal, which are the standard statements about electric and magnetic charges in, in, for ordinary electron systems, okay? Now, the first point that I want to make is that this magnetic monopole is not a dynamical excitation of the underlying quantum many body system. Right? And you take your favorite Hamiltonian for bismuth selenide and add Coulomb interactions or any other interaction that you want. Uh, this magnetic monopole is not going to be, and you diagonalize it exactly in a computer, you're not going to find this as an excitation. Right? This, uh, this magnetic monopole is a device. It's, you've changed the Hamiltonian of the system from whatever it was by introducing a monopole and you're trying to see how this, uh, when you change the Hamiltonian from the physical Hamiltonian by introducing a monopole, you want to see how the system has changed, how, how have the properties of the system changed. So this is not an excitation, okay? So it's not bound by the same rules as ordinary dynamical excitations uh, are bound inside this medium, okay? So now let's do the following. Let's imagine bringing together a monopole with its time reverse partner and seeing what happens. Okay? Now, since the monopole and its time reverse partner have opposite magnetic charge, when I bring them together, I can get rid of the magnetic charge completely. Right? So then I no longer have a magnetic monopole, and whatever's left behind must be a dynamical excitation of the underlying system. Because now I no longer have magnetic charge, it's gone, right? That was just my probe of the system. But this probe has to satisfy some consistency condition. And uh, so the point is that when I bring M and TM together, the result must be an excitation of the underlying material, but M and TM both have the same charge Q, so this uh, resulting object has charge 2Q. And since from the trivial observations of the previous slide, we know that all the excitations of the system have integer charge. 
it must be the 2 q is an integer multiple of the electron charge. Okay? So, that is an important result that we get that constrains the possible magnetic electric charge that a magnetic monopole can pick up inside a time reversal invariant medium. Okay? Now, this equation has, you know, you can solve this equation by dividing both sides by 2. Uh, but really, it only has two distinct solutions. And the point is this. So, one set of solutions, so that Q is 0, E, 2, E, and so on. And the other is that Q is E over 2, 3, E over 2, and so on. Right? Whether it's Q is an integer times E or an integer plus half times E, those are the only two distinct possibilities. Because uh, suppose I said that Q was uh, 2 E, for instance. Right? That really just corresponds to taking two electrons and putting it on top of a monopole. I can always remove those two electrons and produce a neutral monopole. Right? So I can go between the various possibilities within one class by simply binding electrons, an integer number of electrons to the monopole. Okay? Yeah. No. Proof is homework. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you know, catch me at the beginning of my next lecture if you haven't figured it out by then. It's a, it's a really important and interesting question, but uh, it has a very simple answer. Uh, the answer is no, and ho proof is your homework. All right. So there's a fundamental distinction then uh, between these two possibilities, Q equals 0, uh, which is this class, or Q equals E over 2, which is this class. So we see that just the constraints of time reversal and charge conservation allow for the existence of two distinct kinds of insulating media in three dimensions. Ones in which a magnetic monopole picks up integer charge, and others in which a magnetic monopole picks up a charge which is shifted from integer by a half. Okay? Uh, and this first possibility is, corresponds to an ordinary insulator, and the second possibility corresponds to the topological band insulator. Okay? Uh, so how do we know that the second possibility, that th this statement is true? So that's your next homework problem. Uh, you know, topological band insulators, we all know how to describe them. They're described in free fermion theory. Uh, so one way to understand the statement is to take the topological insulator, stick in the magnetic monopole, and explicitly solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, and then look at the electron density, integrate the electron density around the monopole, and see how much charge the monopole has picked up. Okay? And this can, for instance, be done numerically, and people have done that. And you indeed see that it picks up a charge of E over 2. Now, from an analytic point of view, pick any model that you want of the topological insider. A simple model is to say that the surface has a single massless Dirac cone. And then you can try to infer the electric charge of a monopole by solving uh, the Dirac equation that describes the surface of this topological insulator, put, it, put this topological insulator on a sphere, a solid sphere. And the surface is a two-dimensional sphere. Then what you need to do is to solve the Dirac equation of the surface uh, first in the absence of any monopole in the center, next solve it in the presence of a monopole in the center, and then see by how much the ground state uh, charge has changed. And you should be able to see that in the, in the second case, where there's a monopole at the center, the solution of the Dirac equation is such that the many-body ground state has a charge of half. That's not an, if you've not done this kind of calculation before, it's not easy. But it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting and a, a, it's a very instructive calculation to try to do. Yeah? You probably can't see that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in the context, yeah, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. Yes, because I want to prove something about topological band insulators, right? So I want to show, so, so the logic is the following, right? Without, on general grounds, we understood that time reversal symmetric media in three dimensions, right, with the gap and everything. Uh, there's two dis distinct 
responses to a magnetic monopole, either integer charge or integer plus half charge. Right? Now, we want to find examples of both kinds. Right? Uh, the standard insulator, uh, standard band insulator is an example of where the monopole has this property. Uh, the topological band insulator, we want to show that it's an example which has this property. For that, you obviously you know, work within a free fermion description. Uh, but the implication of this observation about the free fermion topological insulator, the, you know, the really interesting implication is what it tells you about the effect of interactions on the state. Okay? Now let's imagine that we've proven this for within a free fermion approximation. But now let's turn on perturbations, any perturbation whatsoever that preserves both charge conservation and time reversal. It can be electron-electron interactions, it can be disorder, anything. Now, uh, because the monopole is fractional charge, uh, in this case, this fractional charge, it's fractional quantized charge, right? It's either A over 2 or 0, right? And because it's quantized, you can't shift it by any small perturbation. It, it, you know, a, a weak interaction added to a free fermion model cannot take this, a charge on a probe monopole from half to 0, right? Because it, this number has cannot change continuously. Right? So this then is the proof that the free fermion, that spin orbit coupled topological insulators in 3D are robust uh, to the presence of electron-electron attractions. Okay? Uh, right, so, no, no, so this argument proves that that is not possible. Because if I turn on interactions, and I, and I keep following the charge of the monopole. Right? It can't jump from E over 2 to 0. You need the bulk gap. You need the bulk gap, absolutely. So I'm assuming that the bulk is gap, so you can characterize it in terms of gap quasi-particle excitations. Right? So, and what really protects this are the symmetries. Right? Uh, to characterize the monopole by its electric charge, or even to talk about monopoles, I need the charge conservation symmetry. And time reversal is what constrained. Uh, if I didn't have time reversal, the charge can change continuously. Okay. So now someone mentioned uh, Witten in 1981. I, I, don't, I don't remember the year, but uh, uh, so some of you may know that the topological band insulator is characterized by this so-called axion response, E dot B response, with the theta term at theta equals pi. Now there's a field theory argument uh, which is known as the Witten effect. Uh, which showed that whenever you have such a response, that the monopole has an electric charge of theta over 2 pi, and if theta is pi, then that gives you half charge. So that's a field theory way of understanding the statement. But you can understand everything. You know, I've not used any field theory so far. Right? Uh, you, know, you can just talk your way out of the field theory in this case, which is the main point. As I said, my emphasis is going to be on the physics. Um, and this line of argument is actually much more powerful, including in situations where we can't just rely on some, you know, to use the field theory argument, we first have to know that this has theta equals pi. And establishing that is, requires some work. Right? So here, I didn't have to do any of that. Yeah. 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 Where would you get this charge in half from? It would come from the bulk? Where would it come from? Right, so the surface. Uh, the surface will get a half. Exactly. Where would it come from? No, no. That, there's a monopole in the middle. Yeah. Right? So the monopole has charge E over 2. Now, that if you push the monopole from the outside vacuum into the center of this thing, then at the surface, it will leave behind an excitation which carries the missing charge, missing charge E over 2. Right. Overall, you have n electrons on the sphere. Right. So, so we are imagining changing the Hamiltonian to introduce a monopole somewhere in the bulk. But in the process, what we are really doing is to go from the outside vacuum 
Im take this hypothetical monopole, drag it from the outside vacuum through the surface into the bulk. Now, as it crosses the interface, right, its charge has changed from zero from the, in the outside vacuum to charge E over 2 in the in, in, inside the solid. Now, how that happens is that at the surface, it will leave behind an excitation that also carries compensating charge E over 2 minus E over 2, so that the net thing is electrically neutral. Right? Okay, so it's from the bulk to the surface. Exactly, yeah. Or from the surface, either way, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. So how does the charge break down when the gap closes? Oh, you, you can't really describe. First of all, the charge that you are, you know, uh, if the gap closes, the charge associated with any particular object is delocalized, right? So, you know, once it's delocalized, how do you really associate charge, sharp charge, to any object inside this medium? Right? So, really, the way to think about it is that the monopole polarizes the medium, and there's a, in some so long as the range of polarization is finite, you can assign that extra charge to the monopole. But once it's gapless, it's going to affect it everywhere. Right? And you can't label excitations. Uh, yeah. Magnetic charges of any fraction? Ah, very good. So, so Dirac quantization tells us that the magnetic charge is fixed. There's, a, there's an elementary <coughs> magnetic charge. Once I fix my electric charge to be E, right, I cannot have a magnetic monopole whose strength is, say, H over 2E. That's inconsistent with Dirac quantization. Right? So, yeah, we're talking about 3D insulators. So the strength of the, the magnetic charge strength, its minimum strength is fixed by Dirac. Right. Yeah. So the charge that comes on the surface, E by the charge, flip is delocalized, right? Yeah, okay. So so it depends on the nature of the state at the surface. So in your standard example, say bismuth selenide or any of these things, indeed the charge at the surface is delocalized. But there are other states that one could imagine, uh, for instance, in strongly correlated systems. And many of us have written papers on this. I have written papers, Natty has written papers, where the surface is gapped. But in the presence of interactions, it turns out it's possible if something weird happens. And then in those gap states, this uh, charge over 2 is indeed localized at a quasi particle of the surface theory. And this reasoning is, in fact, a way to see constrain the properties of that surface theory, that it must have, it can't, you can't trivially gap it, but you can gap it if it has fractional charge and associated with that fractional statistics and so on and so forth. Uh, I might say a little bit about that towards the end of this story. Yeah? For simplicity, let's just assume short range interactions. Coulomb, same will go through with Coulomb. So yeah, I didn't. Oh, there's just a, a a way to understand the statement, right? So so if you so you can study the full band structure, uh, but a simple way to do it is just to try to understand what happens at the surface. So if at the surface you leave behind a charge e over two, then given the monopole in the outside vacuum is neutral. It must be that in, in the bulk of the medium, the monopole has compensating E over 2 charge. So essentially, reversing the response I gave to Asa. I'm assuming the bulk is trivial. And I mean, that's, all, that's been my zeroth order assumption. There's no exotic quasiparticles in the bulk. Good. So this argument is very, very simple, but it's very, very 
you know, important for the conclusion, both for the conclusion that it gives, but also as a line of, as a way of thinking about these topological insulating type faces. Right? Um, yeah, so the, the way of thinking, if you want to formalize it, it's, it goes as follows, right? So you have an SPT phase with some global symmetry, and if it's a consistent phase, then you must be able to consistently couple that global symmetry to background gauge fields, and everything must be consistent. So, and demanding that of a consistent phase of matter uh, is a good thing, and it's a powerful way to constrain what's legal and what's not legal. Okay. Now, in the band theory description, we know that uh, you know, Fermi statistics plays a crucial role. So, so far in my argument, uh, I, I never used Fermi statistics, right? Uh, you know, uh, let's even forget this slide here. I said that there's these two distinct possibilities, uh, but this argument never used anything about uh, the properties of this charge E, of the elementary charge E particles out of which this many body system is made. Could have been bosons, could have been spinless fermions, you know, uh, time, time reversal invariant, but spinless fermions, anything, right? But in band theory, we know that Fermi statistics is important. Obviously, there's no band theory without Fermi statistics. And we also know that it's really important that the electron uh, un, uh, satisfies this Kramer's theorem, that T squared is minus one uh, when it acts on an electron. Right? So let's see uh, how to understand th the requirement for those things by coming out of this general reasoning, which doesn't use band theory anymore. OK? So we said that we will construct the, when we take this M and TM, a monopole and its time reverse partner, and bring them together, we get an object that has charge 2Q, and hence is an allowed excitation of the system. Now let's take the case where 2Q is equal to E, so that it's a possibility that Q is, uh, the charge in the monopole is a half integer. So then what we have done is to construct the elementary electrically charged particle, uh, the physical particle in, in the system, as a bound state of the magnetic monopole and its time reverse partner. OK? Uh, OK. Uh, now, we can understand the structure of this elementary electrically charged particle by solving the quantum mechanics problem of, uh, for this bound state of M and TM, okay? So this now was probably your final homework for, the, for this lecture at least. So this is a really interesting two-particle quantum mechanics problem to solve. A magnetic monopole with charge E over two and its time reverse partner also with charge E over two. Uh, let's imagine that uh, we turn on some interaction that enables them to form a bound state, and then we ask about the properties of this bound state, okay? Now, the crucial point is that because they differ by magnetic charge of one, uh, the, these two objects see each other, uh, so, sorry, they differ by magnetic charge of two, but they carry electric charge of half. They see each other as an electric charge sees a magnetic monopole. So in particular, if I have the magnetic monopole here and its time reverse partner there, and I drag it around a circle, there is a phase, there's a Berry phase, uh, that is equal to one half of the solid angle sub subtended by this path at the origin, okay? So given this phase, if you solve this two-particle quantum mechanics problem, what you'll find is that the bound state is a Kramer's doublet fermion, okay? Uh, it's actually a really, really fun calculation to do, and I strongly urge you to do it. Uh, so, you know, these days I've been teaching quantum mechanics to first-year graduate students. Uh, since it's a two-particle quantum mechanics problem, I decided last year in my final exam to ask them to solve this precisely this problem. Uh, I thought that no one would do it. This is going to be a challenge. But amazingly, almost all the students got it right. So it's really that simple. Students can get it right in an exam context. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right, yeah. So why do you use the language of using quantum mechanics and bound states for classical objects? Just think of it as having infinite mass. 
Right, but probably not change your conclusion, but I that's right. Why, why the language of using mechanics of so you could make it weakly dynamical, right? Uh, you know, take you can take the limit of it being classical, right? But since we're mainly going to be interested in symmetry statements, right, and statistics, it doesn't really matter. We make them weakly. We write down a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian for this guy for these monopoles, uh, make them have large but finite mass, and then solve the quantum mechanics problem. Right? Now, cons the monopole has very strong. If you make it dynamical, it makes very strong interactions. They are non-local. Uh, absolutely. So th there's the non-locality. Right? I'm, I'm perfectly happy with the conclusion. Yes. I'm just questioning whether one can really think of this monopole as being a quantum mechanical object. So you really introduce it as the end of the solid node. This is something that is Right, so the more precise statement is that what we're really doing is to take this uh, topological lens data and couple it to a gauge field uh, and take the limit that the electric charge is, you know, that the gauge coupling is going to zero. But it's the limit of it going to zero, right? So take the weak coupling limit. And the limit that it goes to zero, the Coulomb interaction just, you know, the electromagnetic interaction just becomes a background interaction. But the limit must be smooth, right? And so, so long as we work with slightly non-zero uh, gauge coupling, we can treat the monopoles as dynamical. So that's, that's all that we're doing. Um, Listen, I would have probably failed your exam. So let's ah. <laughs> 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 okay. has not failed a single exam in this lab. <laughs> right. I, I have. <laughs> so, so I failed to be the exam. Let's put the monopole in the center, and you have one particle moving around. Yeah. Uh, so that takes up a very phase of half the area. Right. So that tells me that there's a twofold degeneracy from the usual argument of very phase. Right. Okay. So I got it. So that degeneracy you're calling Kramer's degeneracy. No, 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 no. Why so, is it a fermion? Right. So, so good. So, so, so the. So the degeneracy, first let me explain the degeneracy a little bit more. So the important, the important point for that is that um, under time reversal, the relative wave vector, right, the one that goes from this guy to that guy, that relative wave vector is odd under time reversal, right, because these two are interchanged by time reversal, right. So what you really have is the problem of a the two particle problem maps to the following problem. You have a particle moving on a solid sphere, moving on a surface of, on S2, yeah. right, with a monopole at the center, right. and with an action of time reversal, which is such that the coordinate vector is odd under time reversal. Okay. Now, this is, uh, you know, we can solve this problem, right? So, this is the standard description that of how a spin, you know, we know that this gives you a spin half. Yeah, and, and furthermore, that time reversal, uh, that the coordinate vector, the unit vector, the coordinate unit vector, once you project to this degenerate twofold ground state, that it satisfies the same algebra as the spin commutation relations. Right. So and that gives you t squared equals minus, equals minus one. one. Now, for the fermion, uh, you, you can either solve the two particle, two of these bone state problems and try to exchange them. Or you can just calculate the spin under spatial rotations, oh, okay. right? which is the simpler way. Then you just have to solve the same problem. But now look at the orbital angular momentum of the state. Right? But since it's, that's quantized to be a half, uh, the, spatial, the spin under spatial rotations is a half. So you're not using relativistic invariance? Uh, no, not using relativistic invariance. Okay. Right? So, yeah. Good, thank you. All right. Very good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me move on. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this much, but let me just indicate, uh, because some of you may be curious, uh, let me pose and give you the answer to the converse question. Uh, so we saw that the standard topological insulator, even with interactions, 
has charge you over two on a probe monopole. Now the question is, is this, is the converse true? Suppose I gave you a medium, right, an electronic medium, and I told you that a probe monopole has charge e over two. Okay, does that uh, and it, and I tell you that it's a gap state that preserves these symmetries. You know, it has charge conservation, time reversal. Does that uniquely fix it to be the smoothly connect something that's smoothly connected to the topological band insulator, or could there be other states of ordinary electronic matter? that have the same property. Okay? It turns out that uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, uh, it turns out there's in fact four distinct time reversal symmetric SPT insulators with spin orbit coupling in 3D which have this property. <laughs> Only one of them is describable within band theory and the other three require strong interactions. They are new SPT faces that have no band theory counterpart. Uh, to explain this argument is uh, that the, you know, the reasoning for this, that uh, the physics reasoning for this is actually very simple, but uh, we need some more tools to be able to appreciate that physics reasoning. It's also found uh, uh, in a, a formidable math description uh, of these uh, faces by Dan Fried and Michael Hopkins recently. Uh, <coughs> you know, if you if you have the right math background, which I don't, you may be able to appreciate this paper. Uh, if you have the right physics background, you'll be able to appreciate this argument. Hopefully, towards the end of my, the part of my lectures dealing with SPT, you would have a, the kind of tools that are necessary to understand the argument that leads to this conclusion. Okay? Uh, but this raises, brings me then to the next question that I posed whether there are uh, new faces, uh, new SPT faces that have no non-interacting counterpart. Right? So I told you in the previous slide that for standard spin orbit coupled insulators, yes, there's a total of, uh, if the probe monopole has charged you over two, there's a total of four faces of which three have no non-interacting counterpart. So let's pose this question a bit more generally. Exactly, it can occur only in a fermionic system with, uh, where the fermions have the uh, uh, Kramer's fermions. They have T squared equals minus one. Okay. So, okay. System of Bose. So, naively, you might think that charge of E over 2 on a monopole may happen in a system of interacting bosons. But this argument forbids it. And the same is also true for uh, spinless fermions, you know, with T squared equals plus one. You might naively think that they, they could also be in such a phase. This argument again forbids it. Right? Now, uh, just to make a comment, I, this may connect with something in Natty's talk. So, I'm, since I don't know exactly what he's going to say, I don't know if he will talk about this. But I uh, guess that some of the uh, high energy trained people in the room may actually know these statements from a different point of view. Uh, uh, Somebody already said that this thing is connected to the Witten effect and theta equals pi. And the question is, when is theta equals pi really time reversal symmetric? And the answer depends on, are you going to explain this? And, and the answer depends on whether this theta is periodic mod 2 pi or not, which then depends on whether the theory is on a spin manifold or, or not. And theories of fermions are things that can be put in spin, uh, in spin that should be put in spin manifolds that can only be put in spin manifolds and theories of bosons can be formulated on a non-spin manifold so and the commerce thing I gather has to do with whether I, I don't know if you're going to talk about that either whether you can there's a different kind of whether you can formulate the theory on a suitable <laughs> unoriented manifold or not with there's some words that go with it that Natty might explain. So there's some formal statements from the field theory literature that give you all these constraints as well. And what I've told you gives you a different way of thinking about this, those same constraints, <coughs> which is uh, much more condensed mattery. Right? It's something that I hope all of you have been able to appreciate uh, you know, with whatever background you have. Right? Um, OK. Uh, 
two uh, excitations in a bosonic system. So, uh, uh, an obvious, uh, you know, a simple mind that the half boson excitation would be a, a quasi particle in a superconductor where, where you break the Cooper term. If this, uh, 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 so, so uh, this is not what you mean, right? No, no, I didn't understand. Yeah. You can always break a, a, a Cooper pair into yeah. electrons, yeah. Right, and then you have a T over 2, so the E is the bosonic charge. Right, the good. Excitation. Very good. But your system has a local degree of freedom, which is a fermion. Yeah. Right? When I say a system of bosons, I mean that the elementary charged objects are bosons. Including all gap oh, Including all gap You know, that was my trivial observation. But all energies, absolutely, yeah. So, so if I have pairs of uh, fermions, right. which are very strongly bounded, right. the fact that they, are made eventually, that they are made of fermions with a very, very high energy state still would affect the behavior <coughs> at the low energy? It, it, it changes stability conditions, absolutely, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's a question of whether the underlying theory, that, so you can all, if you make a model, it's like saying in a spin system, there are no local excitations, excitations that are created by local operators that are fermions. Right? Now, of course, you could say that, look, in any real spin system, it comes out of electrons. So above the charge gap, there are electrons. But that's cheating, right? Because you defined your model below the charge gap. Yes, Sandri. That's what I'm going to talk about yeah. next. Right, so we'll see that in a minute because we're going to talk about bosons and everybody <laughs> knows what happens if you make interactions smaller and smaller for bosons. They do the most, most boring thing, which is called boson. <laughs> All right. Uh, so to answer that question, we'll start by studying interacting SPT phases in boson systems. So Andre, you read my mind perfectly because this is indeed the right question to ask. Now, non-interacting bosons are necessarily trivial, right? Bosons, they don't know what to do. I mean, they're, they're in a, there's not much that they can do if they don't interact with each other. They just both connects, right? Find the minimum of the potential and just boom. Uh, right. uh, the minimum energy state and condense. So for anything interesting in a boson system, you had to start right from the beginning with an interacting theory, right? So the crutch of a free fermion model is totally unavailable to you. So in learning to think about boson systems and SPT phases, one would have gone even further in the direction of avoiding the crutch of free fermion Hamiltonians in thinking about this physics of SPT systems. Okay? Uh, and we also know that correlated bosons are a lot easier to understand than correlated fermions. The boson Hubbard model we understand completely. Fermion Hubbard model we don't understand. Okay? So makes sense in thinking about interacting phases to start with bosonic systems and then work one's way up towards interactions, towards fermions. Now, there's been tremendous amount of progress in understanding interacting bosonic SPT phases, which uh, I'll mostly not review. Okay, the pioneer in this uh, area is Erisberg, uh, more or less started the field. Uh, along with a uh, number of these other people uh, uh, several years back by thinking about classifying all these uh, boson SPT phases in one dimension. And there's been a great deal of progress. Uh, 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 what I'm going to do is to illustrate the physics with two examples, one in two dimensions and one in three dimensions. I'll keep things very, very simple and elementary. So the simple example in two dimensions that I'll talk about is actually a fun question to, to think about. Okay? Uh, we all know that fermions can show an integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, what about bosons? Can bosons show an integer quantum Hall effect? Okay? Uh, you know, the integer quantum Hall effect of electrons we understand in terms of completely filling some lander levels. Now, for bosons, the concept of filling some single particle levels 
to completely fill a Lando band simply doesn't make any sense. Right? So this way of obtaining an integer quantum Hall state just doesn't work. Right? So we had to think of some other way of describing a putative integer quantum Hall state of bosons. Okay? Uh, so what do we mean by integer quantum Hall state? At the very least, we must demand that the Hall conductivity is quantized to be an integer. Uh, but we'll make an additional demand that the bulk has no fractional statistics quasi-particles. After all, the electronic integer quantum Hall effect doesn't have fractional statistics. Right? So let's demand the same of the bosonic, of a putative bosonic integer quantum Hall state. Okay? Uh, so let's see what can, whether such a state can exist and what some of its properties are. Okay? So I'll describe one example of such a state. So the answer is that indeed bosons can show an integer quantum Hall effect, okay? And I'll describe an, a simple example of this, this, of such a state of matter. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a very specific model with an explicit Hamiltonian. Uh, so the model will consist of two species of bosons, B1 and B2, in a both moving in two space dimensions in a strong perpendicular magnetic field, okay, in the quantum Hall regime. And I'm going to assume that the density of bosons is such that each boson species is at a filling factor of one. That means the number of each species is equal to the number of external flux quanta. Okay? And the Hamiltonian the kinetic term is just what I described in words. And I'll turn on an interaction uh, both between bosons of the same species and bosons of the opposite species, which is some generic short range interaction. In fact, it turns out through numerical studies, we know that the mo most sim mo the simplest interaction you can think of, just a delta function repulsion, is already enough for the, to put the system into the phase that we want. Right, so just think about uh, contact interaction, delta function, okay? Uh, and this rho i is bi dagger bi, it's the density of species i. So what can we say about this system, okay? So this is the problem I'm defining, and I'm going to argue that this model, uh, that I'm going to describe a candidate phase for this model, which one can confirm through real calculations. The candidate phase will be an integer quantum Hall state of bosons with the properties that I demanded. And it'll turn out that it's a very simple example of an SPT phase of bosons in two dimensions. Okay? Uh, if you wish, you can think about a bilayer system, two layers. Species one is in the red layer, species two is in the blue layer, it's a perpendicular magnetic field. And uh, the way I've defined the Hamiltonian, the symmetries, or that the number of bosons of either species is separately conserved. Right? So this Hamiltonian uh, conserves separately uh, B1 dagger B1 integrated over all space and B2 dagger B2 integrated over all space. There's no possibility for bosons to mix, of the two species to mix with each other for the time being. So there's two separate global U1 symmetries associated with separate conservation of N1 and N2. So later, uh, it will turn out that it's very easy. We, we'll relax this conservation of uh, separately of N1 and N2, relax it to conservation of just total N1 plus N2, by allowing bosons to tunnel from one layer to the other. Okay? Uh, so we can also define the total charge N1 plus N2 as the total electrical charge of the system. And uh, then there's a corresponding quantity, N1 minus N2, which is independent. And we'll call that the total pseudo spin. And this currents of both charge and spin, of pseudo spin, the charge current is something in which there's a net motion of both species in some direction. That will give you a charge current. Now, even if there's no charge current, if the two species move in opposite directions, there's no charge current. There's a current of this conserved quantity and we'll call that a pseudo spin current. Okay? So it's interesting then to ask about response 
to voltages that couple both to the uh, uh, to the total charge and to the total pseudo spin charge. Okay. Um, okay. So what might the system do? Uh, so we might make a guess for what the system does by noticing that if the interspecies repulsion is fairly strong, maybe comparable or bigger than the intraspecies repulsion, then the particles of the of opposite species want to avoid each other. Right? They want to stay as far away from apart from each other if they repel each other. Right? So one way to implement that in a first quantized ground state wave function is uh, to put in a factor of Zi minus Wj, where Zi and Wj are the complex coordinates of the two <laughs> species. Uh, if we put in such a factor in a low slander level wave function, uh, uh, then each time a Zi approaches a Wj, there is a zero of the wave function. Right? So the amplitude for finding a particle of one species right on top of a particle of the other species is set to zero. Right? Energetically, we might imagine that that is a good thing uh, for the ground state to do. Right? Uh, so that would be a guess. Now that guess then suggests the following mean field theory. Yeah. It's definitely a possibility and it's an energetic question what happens. Right? Now for the delta function interaction, uh, which is symmetric, both V11 is the same as V12. Uh, it turns out that phase separation is not what is realized. But if V12, in the limit that V12 goes to infinity, indeed phase separation is what we get. Good. So this factor of Z i minus W j means that when I take a Z i all the way around any W j, right? Take one species all the way around another species, the phase of the wave function winds continuously by two pi. This means that each species of particle sees the other species of particle as a two pi vortex. Okay. So that suggests a flex attachment theory of the kind that is familiar from standard quantum hall literature that we now attach one flux quantum of one species to each boson of the other species. Okay. Uh, let these pictures sort of say this in words. So I'll call these mutual composite bosons. These are new entities that I've created. Okay. Uh, these are, have bosonic statistics. And the reason they have bosonic statistics is because they see flux of the other species. So they saw flux of the same species. This will be a way to convert bosons to fermions in two dimensions. But now I'm attaching flux of the other species, and that doesn't change the statistics at all. Now, if by definition of my problem, my filling factor is nu equals 1 for each boson species. And this filling factor, once I go to these flux attached composite bosons, these composite bosons move in an average field that is 0. The external field is exactly compensated by the attached flux. Okay? So then these mutual composite bosons, uh, they, you know, uh, since they now move in 0 field, they will just condense. Right? And that will give me a description of a possible state that the system could be in. Okay? So let me describe the physical properties. Again, I was sort of giving this talk, imagining the experimentalist in mind. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, it may be a bit challenging for theorists because sometimes things that are very easy for experimentalists become challenging for theorists. <laughs> right? uh, so the formal way to do this is to do the flux attachment through a churn simons theory and then do a churn simons landau ginzburg theory and get the right topological field theory, there will be a K matrix, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you can do all that. Right? But I'm going to give what's essentially the same thing, but in true physical description. Right? <coughs> so we've had this condensate of these composite bosons, these mutual composite bosons, and let's study the electromagnetic response of this system by turning on voltages. Right? Uh, the simpler way to think about it is what happens if there's a current of, say, the first species of composite boson that goes in that y direction, what does it do? 
right? Now it's condensed, so there's no voltage drop along that direction. It's like a superfluid. There's no voltage drop because it's condensed. Uh, it can support a current without the voltage drop. But because it ca it's this the object that's carrying this current is carries flux of the other species. The, it drags the flux along with it, and when the flux moves, there's a transverse voltage that's introduced. Okay. Uh, I mean, hopefully, this is all so trivial, it's freshman physics, right, uh, that you don't really have difficulty. But I'm not writing down a Lagrangian or anything, right. So that explains this first equation. So that the current in the y direction of species 1 of composite bosons will give me not a voltage drop in the, x, in the y direction, but it gives me a voltage drop in the x direction and, and only for species 2. And likewise, there's an equation, uh, there's a corresponding equation with 1 and 2 interchanged. Okay? Yeah? No, no, so this is fictitious flux, right? It's this attached flux. The physical magnetic field is always uniform, right? No, but there's a current. There's a current. So the, in the steady state, there's a current, right? I've, Im, imagine I've attached current sources, right? And if I induce the current of particle 1, since particle 1 is bound to flux of 2, the only way current can move is if this, this object moves. Right? And when this object moves, uh, uh, there is a voltage drop in the transverse direction. Yes. I'm going to talk about the edge in a minute, but Adi. Sure. Even though yeah. the whole effect is supposed to uh, cancel the low-end force on a layer where the current is flowing, still you get the whole voltage in the other layer and not in the layer where there is current. So it's an interesting question. That, uh, the gallium arsenide bilayers new equals yeah. half for each layer. This, uh, this is a bosonic version of that kind of statement. Yeah. How should we think of this kind of argument? Is this an exact statement or? It's exact. This, this, these equations are exact. Right. Oh, good, good, good. Right. So, for this Hamiltonian, right, so I'm not deriving for you these exact, the, the equations in the later slide, exactly starting as an exact consequence of this Hamiltonian. What we are producing is a mean field theory for Hamiltonians of this sort. So it's not an exact rewriting of this. It's not an exact rewriting of, uh, 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 that's right. It's, I mean, so there's various sub stages in which you can do things exactly. So this uh, flux attachment is something that uh, can be done exactly. It's an exact rewriting. But then I make a mean field approximation to that exact Hamiltonian. Right? And the mean field approximation is, saying that on average, the attached flux cancels the external magnetic field, right? And that mean, mean field approximation introduces uncertainty, right? So the best that one, the point of view that one can take is that this is a candidate state. If I do the mean field, do fluctuations about the mean field, I can describe a possible state of matter that can exist in this system. Whether it's exactly the state of matter or not, will have, have to be settled by other kinds of organs. In this case, you can just solve the problem on a computer and check that it has the properties that match the state that I'm going to describe. And that has been done. A few papers m many of us wrote a few years back. I said this earlier, but maybe it's worth saying that you could, of course, 
start from central thermal zoning and map it on the Jan Simon theory and using Jan Simon theory to very big that modulo the assumption that the zone and the map is work. Yeah. So the That's right. But yeah. Once you start making the mean field approximation, it's a good thing to do in general, but it's not clear that it's always exactly the same as the original system. Right. So, so, so the you know, it's sort of not very different from saying if for a three D icing model, at some temperature, you now I have a description of the ferromagnetic state. Right. I make a mean field approximation and then you do some fluctuations or you know, take the 3D XY model. I make a mean field approximation, then I do small fluctuations about it. Now, how do I really know that I'm in that phase and not in the paramagnetic phase, the XY model? Because I don't know the critical temperature exactly. But I know that this is a reliable description of one phase of the system. And depending on parameters, the system will either land in that phase or land in the paramagnetic phase. So it's the same story here. This is a good description. It's an exact description of a possible phase of the system. But for what Hamiltonian is it, the exact description, right? So that has to be determined by microscopic calculations, which I'm not doing, but which in this case can be done and have been done. Okay, I think I should finish, right? The, it's, uh, let me just wind up this part of the story, and then uh, we can break. Uh, right, so now these two equations, these are exact, once I, make this as, uh, for, for the state of matter that I'm describing, these equations are exact. And these then imply that there's an, a total electrical hole conductivity of two and a pseudo spin hole conductivity of minus two. So the reason it's two here is that if I apply a voltage that couples the total electric charge, so then there's a V that couples to N1 plus N2, that means that V, that that means that V1x is equal to V and V2x is equal to V. The total current, which is the rate at which the N1 plus N2 is transported, is then, uh, so if I sum these two equations, I get E squared over H times V1x plus V2x for the total current. But V1x equals V2x equals V. And so there's a factor of 2, and then I get a whole conductivity of 2. And likewise, if I apply a pseudo spin voltage, I'll get a pseudo spin whole conductivity of minus 2. So this satisfies my first requirement that it's an integer quantum Hall state because sigma xy is manifestly an integer. Now because there's both an electrical and pseudo spin Hall conductivity with opposite signs, we immediately know what the edge states look like. At the edge, there's an edge mode that carries electrical charge current that's going in one direction. But there's a, a, another edge mode which ha has to exist because of pseudo spin Hall conductivity. And because the pseudo spin hole connectivity has the opposite sign, this other edge mode must be going in the opposite direction. So the counter flow edge mode that goes in the backward direction, while there's a total charge, same flow edge mode that goes in the forward direction. Okay? So this counter propagating edge states, unlike in the standard integer quantum hole effect of electrons, uh, but only one branch transports electric charge. Right? N1 plus N2 charge. So this means, for instance, that the thermal Hall conductivity, if you couple, uh, produce a temperature gradient in this direction, to ask about the heat current in that direction, there's no heat current. Okay? So the thermal Hall conductivity is zero because equal numbers of edge channels going both in the forward and backward direction. But the electrical Hall conductivity is non-zero because only one of them transports electric charge. They can have different velocities, so all that doesn't matter. So now, this was a description in a system with U1 cross U1 <coughs> symmetry. So now let's start relaxing the symmetries and seeing what happens. Okay? We can, first, we can allow interspecies tunneling, okay? which uh, preserves conservation of N1 plus N2, but breaks conservation, explicitly breaks conservation of N1 minus N2. Now, uh, so, uh, so the key point is that even if only 
n1 plus n2 is conserved. Uh, this, and even though there are counter propagating edge modes, you can't backscatter the forward moving channel to the back downward moving channel because charge conservation prevents that. Th this mode carries charge, non zero charge. This mode carries zero charge. So you can't have a scattering event in which a, 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 the right mover goes to a I mean, top mover goes to a bottom mover. That's forbidden by charge conservation. Okay. So the only thing that you need to protect the structure of edge state is electrical charge conservation. You don't need pseudo spin conservation. The pseudo spin edge mode will no, no, no. The pseudo spin edge mode cannot backscatter into anything else. Because the only thing it can backscatter into is the this charge carrying mode. So even though that conservation is not there, the pseudo spin current is chiral, so it can't disappear. Right? Uh, so charge conservation alone protects this edge mode structure, which is non-trivial, right? And it gives you an integer quantum Hall effect. But suppose I break charge conservation completely. These are bosons. I imagine I come with a giant superfluid that I put on top of this boson system. In the Hamiltonian level, imagine adding a term that's linear in the boson creation operator, right? So then there's nothing any longer to prevent backscattering. And two edge modes can then couple to each other and gap themselves out, right? So the robustness of the edge states relies on the presence of charge conservation symmetry, but it only relies on charge conservation symmetry, right? Uh, yeah? Did I prove the incompressibility? Did I prove the incompressibility? That's, uh, you know, uh, the composite boson description just gives that to me for free. Uh, you know, uh, it's a uh, Meissner effect, if you wish, for the internal gauge feed. Uh, you know, just like in the usual composite boson description, um, uh, the flux of the internal gauge field is the electrical charge. And once I go into a composite boson condensate, that flux is expelled from the medium. That's the same as incompressibility. No, no, no. I, I'm condensing the composite boson. Each composite boson is moving in zero field. Each composite boson is moving in zero field. So don't you have a gap that's not uh, for the boson? Only at the boundary. No, no. Uh, uh, in the electronic one, half plus one half. Right. Also in the bulk, you right. So in the electronic one, it spontaneously breaks in the bulk the pseudo spin symmetry. Here it's a quantum Hall insulator for the pseudo spin. Uh, current as well. So it's different from the electronic problem in that respect. <coughs> right. So, so this then is a very simple example of a symmetry protected topological phase of bosons. Now you can go through the formal description in terms of flux attachment and derive the right topological theory. And uh, uh, it's uh, a Chern-Simons theory with two gauge fields and a K matrix which has determinant K modulus equals one. And the K matrix is zero, one, one, zero. For those of you who know what a K matrix is, the, uh, so the description is A1 DA2 over two pi plus A external times D A1 plus A2 over two pi. And if you know enough about chern simons theories, then you know that this system has no ground state degeneracy on a torus. It uh, has no fractional statistics, uh, but it has a quantum Hall effect. Okay? So you can prove all that. So let me end with this slide. Uh, so the state that I described has electrical Hall connectivity of 2, but thermal Hall connectivity of 0. Okay? And this state really exists. You know, we can do numerics on this model with delta function repulsion, do an exact diagonalization, and show this unique ground state on a torus, and so on and so forth. Okay, and there's an incompressible state with a, which has a unique ground state on a torus, and so on. Uh, no, two two species. That, it could be done with one. Right? Uh, it could be done with one. With one, the answers are a bit confusing, so we don't quite know. But there are by no various other models, there are lattice models uh, on which through DM, Yin Chen He, you know, the, 
this DMRG on lattice models, which clearly shows the existence of this phase. Okay, so now clearly there are many other states of the sort that we can get. We can stack together many copies of this state and produce for you a, a, a state, uh, a phase of a boson system which has sigma xy equals any even integer 2n and kappa xy equals 0. Right? Clearly that's possible. Now, there's a very general comment that I want to make that for bosons, such an integer quantum Hall state necessarily has sigma xy even, unlike for fermions where sigma xy is any integer. Okay? So, where does this come from? So, the example that I constructed obviously satisfies this. So, it's a very simple argument that shows that this has to be the case, uh, almost trivial argument. So, the point is this. Suppose there's a putative integer quantum Hall state of bosons, meaning the Hall connectivity is an integer, and there are no fractional statistics objects anywhere in the bulk. The, the only excitation in the bulk are trivial particles. Now, let's do what Laughlin taught us to do, told us to do in the quantum Hall effect, thread in 2 pi flux somewhere. This must create an elementary excitation of the system. Okay? Now, when you thread in 2 pi flux into a quantum Hall system, the, you know, there's an induced DMF as you adiabatically turn on some flux. And because of the Hall response, there's a current that flows in, in the radial direction. So there's some charge that's accumulated uh, in the flux. Now, this Laughlin's famous argument to argue for fractional charge in the quantum Hall effect. So the charge that you pick up is sigma xy, and the resulting particle. Uh, has fraction statistics, has anionic statistics of pi times sigma xy. Okay? Now, the assumption that there's no topological order, meaning no anions in the system, means that all the excitations, all these particles must be bosons. Okay? That's only possible if sigma xy is an even integer. Okay? So that's the proof. Now, Right, so you had to imagine taking two of these things, uh, two of these particles, taking one around the other, and carefully calculating the Arduino bohm phase. You take it halfway around. Sorry? You take it halfway around. You take it halfway around, exactly. Okay? So this is the argument, this is the reason, right? Now again, you might hear the same result in Natty's talk. Uh, I, I'm not sure. You might hear the same result. And it'll be phrased in the following way. You know, when is chern simon theory well defined? Right? Now, on a non spin manifold, so bosons can be formulated in this non spin manifold, which Natty might explain. On a non spin manifold, the coefficient of, the, of, an, of an abelian chern simons term must be an even integer. And there's no need for a gravitational chern simons term. That's this guy. Now, it turns out there are states where kappa x, y is non-zero, but they must be eight times an integer. And that's a different story. And that, again, may make an appearance. If you see the number eight appear in front of a gravitational churn simons term in Natty's talk, there is a simple condensed matter explanation for it, which is a counterpart of this thing. All right, let me stop here. Sorry, went over. <laughs>